Welcome to the Commercial Real Estate Podcast powered by First National. I'm Aaron Cameron. With me, as always, Adam Pawadek, recording live here at Real Capital. Our guest today is Teresa Neto, who is the CFO of Granite REIT. Teresa, thanks for coming on. Thank you. Thank you, Adam and Aaron. Nice to meet you in person. So we we did an episode not too long ago with Kevin Gorey, mm-hmm. uh, who is your CEO, mm-hmm. and so we'll encourage our listeners if, if they're if they're here and don't recall or want to go back, that episode will give a nice sort of overarch of the the sort of the I don't call it fifty thousand foot view of Granite Reed and the history uh, lesson and the history the, lesson yeah. that's there. Yes. Uh, and we're going to focus a little bit more on sort of the nuts and bolts with your particular role as CFO. Before we go there, though, um, we always like to just talk about people's career paths. So how did you get into, or how did you become a CFO at Granite Reed, and how did you get into real estate in the first place? Okay, so I have a quite a long career, so I'm not going to get into all go the Go ahead, we got all the time <laughs> in the world. <laughs> all the time, but like, let's call it, it started in 1986, so I'm ancient, and I have over 35 years of experience, but I didn't start in real estate, so I'm a CPA by training, and back then that was chartered accountant. And I really started articling with one of the big eight at that time, uh, which was Touche Ross, a former uh, predecessor of Deloitte, and uh, got my CA and figured out pretty quick I didn't want to become a partner. And that's when I went into industry. But um, I did I did have a chance to work in a number of industries. So I did work in the communications industry, the consumer packaged goods, and then telecom, and then ultimately landed in uh, real estate. The one good thing about that experience is I got to do a variety of things uh, throughout that time, and I was always open to trying something new. So um, early on, I was, you know, an internal auditor, you know, some someone everybody hates in- internally, but <laughs> it was a lot of fun because I was working for a newspaper company at the time, and uh, I got to travel all across Canada, and I was 25 and having a lot of fun uh, doing it and learning a lot. And then uh, when I went into consumer packaged goods, that was kind of my fp a career and controller career. And then when I got to uh, telecom, um, I got the opportunity to work in the treasury group, which was which, which was great learning because we were raising a lot of capital then. I was working for one of the first uh, CLEX, which were when when uh, the government deregulated uh, phone lines. We were one of the first companies out there building uh, competitive uh, f- the competitive phone business and cable business. Uh, against the big guys like Bell and Telus. So that was a lot of learning, um, and certainly from the Treasury side, you know, raising, you know, high yield debt um, at the time, and then frankly, going bankrupt and going through a CCAA. <laughs> so lots of experience there. And then, um, then I, you know, found myself without a job, and uh, an opportunity came up in real estate. And I think a lot of you are familiar with RealPack, and an opportunity came up at RealPack, and it was something I'd never done before. And that means lobbying. And it was perfect timing because um, at that time, uh, we were going through a transition to IFRS in Canada. So I thought, great, I haven't picked up a handbook in like 10 to 15 years. And it was going to force me to learn kind of all about what was changing on the accounting front. And I went totally outside of my box. So I was lobbying the ISB, the FASB, working with you know uh, international counterparts um, on, the, on IFRS. And I was teaching courses uh, across Canada. I was teaching IFRS for real estate. So really used another side of my brain, which uh, I I never thought I had. But it was uh, was a good thing. Created another side of your brain. (laughs) Yeah, created (laughs) another side. And then an opportunity came up for a CFO position at a very small REIT. Uh, It was Retrocom REIT, which ultimately uh, transformed into one REIT and then was ultimately bought out. And then from there, I've worked for a number of REITs. Um, I've been involved in two takeovers. So I was involved with Key REIT. On which was... side of the equation for the takeovers? <laughs> bought both okay. times. Bought both times. Uh, so Key REIT um, was bought out by ultimately what is Plaza Retail REIT right now. And, uh, and then when I was at Pure Industrial with Kevin, uh, Blackstone acquired us in 2018. And then um, Kevin did go to Granite. And uh, I did work with the Blackstone team uh, for a good year and a half. And, but then Kevin offered an opportunity to, be, to, Convinced to, you. to, to come over to Granite. And, and I definitely said yes. So that does obviously say something about his leadership. Okay, we're going to do this chronologically because I have a whole bunch of follow-up questions. Okay. Hey, one, you, you're now, and we'll get into the sort of the triple B or the unsecured debt that you're now issuing. What yeah. was the level of debt that you're <laughs> issuing for that telecoms company? 
Oh, it was high yield debt. Yeah. So we were in the high yield market seven, I remember in the seven, eight percent range. So it was yeah. unrated basically. So, it was like, unrated. Like it, was, it was the junk bond market. Yeah. But we raised billions of junk bonds. Uh, just based on the promise. Does that have anything to do with why you went bankrupt? <laughs> <laughs> it might have something to do. If you recall, that was like in the 2000 range. Yeah. So yes, it had a lot to do with that. But it was a lot of fun while it lasted. Uh, Learned yeah. a lot. But yeah, you know, ultimately the revenue that we were ultimately planning for and pro formering never did transpire, which ultimately led to the bankruptcy. And then the other one, I'll just, you know, we, you mentioned Real Pack. I don't know if Michael was there or not, but you can go back and listen to an episode with Michael Brooks yep. on Real Pack. We'll put all these links in yeah, the exactly. show notes. Yeah, you're like you're missing a lot of keep, episodes here. <laughs> yeah, I like that. Um, and and it really, that Michael will, in that episode describe the history of Real Pack, the purpose of Real Pack, you know, how it positions itself as the community's lobbying entity. Yes. Uh, and they do a, fa a fantastic job uh, representing all of our interests uh, to the government. They really do. And I can honestly say I saw that impact directly as we were lobbying, you know, with our counterparts, certainly with the U.S., their heavyweights uh, on the lobby front. But, you know, we were working with the Europeans and the British team and the Asians. And I'll tell you, like we we submitted, we met with them constantly and we did make some changes. And they and they and I think there are some IFRS amendments or ultimately what we're working with today because of that lobbying effort. Is that what you're different. most proud of your time uh, there? Definitely, yep. definitely, yeah. It was how effective we, we were, and frankly, Ropex a great organization. Like they really do represent the Canadian real estate, uh, commercial real estate, uh, extremely well, and it's excellent value as a member. Um, the type of support that they provide. Yep, agreed. Yep, first national proud card carrying member. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now you're at Granite. Mm -hmm. What's the environment like today in uh, February of 2023? <laughs> I think the environment is, it, it's, it's very good. Look, I mean, um, we've had a very good run in the last three years when, you know, many other uh, real estate asset classes were, you know, suffering. Uh, we have the benefit of being 100% pure play industrial REIT and benefit uh, well during the pandemic. Obviously, the early months we suffered like everyone else, but once you kind of saw an exit out of the pandemic and e-commerce took hold, uh, and as you all know, the industrial um, asset values, you know, skyrocketed. Uh, the demand for industrial spray space um, increased. Our, our, you know, everything was everything was moving well. But of course, last year things slowed down. But I think for for granted, I mean, we still had a few things at play. And um, you know, even though you know we put pens down when the pretty well the, the markets closed, and particularly the equity markets closed. And now debt markets, you know, the, the cost of debt has skyrocketed versus to where, where we were before. I think now, um, you know, we the transactions are off the table, but we were able to focus on development. And our development program remains very strong, um, and it's it, it's going to be delivering some very strong yields for the, for the REIT. So that focus and that discipline, I think, is going to... Um, it leads us to some optimism down the line. And I think we're going to see some, um, some, some strong performance, certainly in 23 and 24, because one of the development program and two, because of the structure of our leasing. Uh, don't forget, like our European assets are largely tied to CPI adjustments. This is obviously going to be, uh, it's going to have an impact on certainly um, our Sorry, on on uh, revenues going forward in, for twenty three and and potentially twenty four. So what is that? CVI adjustment. Sorry, uh, sorry, CPI. C oh, CPI. okay, okay, sorry. Yeah, I thought that was CPI a European consumer price yeah, index. Yeah, yeah. Consumer price index. For the so. record, I know what that is. I thought it was, that was a <laughs> yeah. European thing. I thought My that apologies. was like, yeah, yeah. CPI like, index. Okay. <laughs> I, I maybe spoke a little too quickly. Um, no, no, it's good. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, so it's so one question back to the to the pandemic. So mm -hmm. March twenty twenty, everybody kind of you know. Uh, lives somewhere on a spectrum of uh, either low grade panic to high grade panic. Uh, given that you were a pure play industrial, which for sure would have had the most breathing room the quickest coming uh, coming out of that. Uh, what month from March onwards did you kind of finally, uh, you know, breathe a sigh of relief that uh, at least in your your space you were going to be in good shape? I think it would say around June or July, and I think certainly from our our investment team, they were able to squeeze in. For example, a few acquisitions that were overlooked in the market, and, and a couple of them were in the GTA. So, you know, assets, when we were, you know, one thing about uh, Granite, too, we we're always prepared for, for war. And I think that put us in a really um, particularly good 
a situation relative to our to some of our peers. So we had beefed up our liquidity. We always kept our leverage low. Uh, we have you know access to a very large credit facility. And so what that di did is give us an advantage to uh, to to get in the market early. Uh, in those early summer months and pick up a couple of assets. And, you know, we're talking about at that time, you know, over 5%, uh, you know, cap rates. So that quickly dropped to like three in a matter of months. But I think we knew that the market was going to start to become transactional. And we just saw the demand and, and beyond, you know, the GTA. I mean, as you know, we're, we're about 50% of our uh, exposure is in the U.S. And the U.S. came back roaring first before any market because they took a much more lenient uh, stand on COVID and they were back at it quite quick and transactions were happening and we were able to one access you know equity and debt uh, at a very low cost of capital relative to today and we were able to take advantage uh, in markets where cap rates were not quite so sharp but they, they were on the uh, they were coming down this they were going to come down quite quickly following that but I think that's when we knew it was in the summer uh, and just by the activity that we were starting to see. And given your large access to capital, you probably weren't losing that much sleep in the months leading up to it. Even though there was threats of, you know, lack of capital availability, you already had a, a pretty, very comfortable situation. Yeah, but I mean, not to say that, you know, it was a little tense in March and April because you weren't quite sure, you know, how the tenants were going to react. And uh, for, the, for the tenant base, you know, also to what kind of government regulation uh, would, be, would be issued, and would we would our tenants have to close? And and as you know, Granite has a fairly large exposure to Magna, and you know at that point in time, supply chains were disrupted, um, and you know they had to close for a pe very short period of time some of their operations. So was that you know at that point in time, you know the big question mark was, are they going to open? What tenants are going to uh, are tenants going to close? How is this going to impact rent collection and so forth? But you know. Soon we found out, and again, this is one of the fortunate uh, aspects of the industrial asset class, is everybody was deemed. Um, yeah. So, so what we found out was that our tenants, you know, for the most part, they were deemed essential. So most of our tenant base continued to operate during the pandemic, and not only that, but the demand for space, um, you know, really uh, increased through e-commerce, supply chain disruptions, onshoring, all of those themes, uh, and that continues today. And so we're continuing to see that demand for our space. And we were able to really uh, take advantage of that in 2020 and 21. So, so 2023 today, rents are up dramatically mm -hmm. in the industrial space. Um, your leverage point is probably as, as low as, as it's ever been. Is there a demand or is there a need to take on more debt? Like what's your current strategy for, for you know, raising capital? No, I mean, I think with Granite, we... You know, we are very disciplined when it comes to our leverage, and uh, we look at both, you know, the leverage, but more importantly, debt to EBITDA. And actually, for granted, we've been operating at certainly lower levels than we are today. And part of that is that we did, uh, we we were funding a fairly large um, development program that, you know, was almost 6 million square feet, which now, you know, mo which a good chunk of that is now coming online in 23. But in order to fund that, you know, we did take on additional debt. But you, you see the end of the line, and we know that that, NO, that NOI and that EBITDA is going to be flowing through nicely at the end of 23 and 24 and take us back down to, you know, debt to EBITDA levels that we're more comfortable with. And for granted, you know, that's in that six and a half times to seven times range. And, you know, we're a little bit elevated today, but we see a path forward to where we can get to that. So, no, I don't think that I think we're, you know, I think liquidity is still very important today in, in this market. And, uh, you know, we want to make sure we preserve that liquidity. Aaron and I are property level um, financers, mm -hmm. so we are opposed to your strategy of unsecured debentures. But <laughs> Stop it. Yeah. Stop doing it. <laughs> but let's at least examine the merits of uh, what it might bring to the table. Mm -hmm. um, and you're, are you 100% unsecured debentures as your financing mechanisms? We are virtually 100%. We have a small construction loan that is secured against a development in the U.S. Okay. Yeah. And in the current... The current <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, folks, we're done here. Um, and so... In the current environment, uh, I, I know last year I think there was some unsecured debentures that not not for you but for other groups that might have had uh, some some rocky transitions. Um, but the, there's capital availability. I know that pricing is generally below what you'd find in the in the traditional mortgage market. Mm -hmm. Is that all still true? Is that uh, 
I think experience? now the unsecured market could be a little bit more elevated uh, relative to the secured market, but I don't know if it's enough for us to uh, reach out to the secured market. But having said that, I mean, I, you know, it is not part of our program. We typically look at secured as our last resort. Sorry, guys. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Just because the uns- I mean, you know, it, 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 it's fair to me to say as an investment grade rate uh, rated entity, I mean, it's, you know, we don't have to go to the secured market, you know, under more normal times. And the unsecured market is extremely efficient and you get access to large sums of, of debt uh, quickly and, uh, and it's very efficient. So, but there is a, you know, potentially a place for the secured market. We do have to be careful simply even from a rating agency point of view, our rating agencies, they don't like to see a lot of secured debt. So even if we were to enter some type of secured debt, it would be in a, on a small level. We're talking about 10%, 15% maximum. Certainly one of our rating agencies, that's the kind of levels that they want to see. So no matter what, we're going to manage to that. And we have to keep a fairly large pool of unencumbered assets. But I could see for some very select assets, so those you know really high-grade tenants, uh, high, high credit rated tenants, uh, long-term lease, good cash flow, I think though there could be a potential uh, one or two assets in our portfolio that it could fit rather well. But at this point in time, it's not a high priority while we still can access some unsecured debt. I, I too, I, I absolutely appreciate while I don't like it, I appreciate the, the efficiency and, and why it's so attractive. Um, would, would you say, well, or, or maybe put it another way, how do you manage the balloon risk, right? I mean, you're taking these these large tranches out They've got to be paid back at some duration. Is it just you're taking that risk? You can roll it back into another one, or is there an availability of capital? Like, how does how do you manage that as as CFO? I think you always have to believe that the, the the bond market is going to be there. Now we know practically that's not always the case, but you do it in two ways. One, you stagger your debt maturities. So um, you definitely want to make sure that you have some debt probably 10 to 15 percent hopefully of your of your total debt rolling each year you don't want it bigger than that because then yes you have a big balloon that you need to refinance but to be a debenture issuer too the market you, you need to be a consistent issuer uh, for the investors one to continue to follow the credit and then you'll perform better from a credit spread because they have a bit of history for you so you need to build that up so that's that you have to so, be cons- so a knowledge. So, so just the the the, buy, the the investor's knowledge base of you yes. implicates mm-hmm. the pricing. Yeah, they prefer you know repeat issuers for sure because then you start to build a, a credit history with your investors and they stay up on the name and then you can actually then access the market quicker. You don't need to do, for example, like a two week trade uh, road show. Road show, yeah, a road show to meet investors. They kind of know you. You're meeting them. Uh, certainly at least once every year, if not twice a year. So you're continuing to have conversations with them. If they believe, they'll take that time because a lot of them are usually managing not only just one ask, one investment type, but multiple investment types, and they're generalists typically. So you want to make sure that they stay uh, current in your name. So that's part of it. And so the other thing that uh, certainly that we've done is you always need a fallback. Um, you know, if the markets are closed. And so for us, um, that fallback is the credit facility. So it's important to have a a good credit facility that you can, uh, of a certain size, that you know you can absorb some type of maturity if if it were to come to that. Event, some sort uh, of maturity event. Exactly. So one of your uh, debt maturity is rolling. And with Granite too, when, uh, you know, we had a credit facility of half a billion. And then when we saw the markets opened up again, um, the markets, you know, the, the bank market closed certainly in 2020, but in 21 or early 21, when it opened up again, we took, took that opportunity and, and we doubled size. So we now we have a credit facility of a billion dollars. So, you know, we have that confidence that, you know, our largest, our, our largest debt maturity is 500 million. I know I can absorb that through the credit facility if I really had to. So that's a couple of ways that you can sort of manage those, those maturity schedules. What do you do, um, or let me put it another way. What are the different types of unsecured debt structure? So, I mean, I'm, I'm super ignorant, so I apologize. I can tell you about the secured world in great detail. But, you know, it's obviously you're, you're issuing, you're, you've, do you pick the amount or you're, you're asking for a subscription amount? You're taking in bids, I guess, and you're hoping that it comes to a, a, certain, a certain dollar amount. Are you picking the duration? Are you picking whether it's, you know, refinanceable? Like we had talked about open and closed and, mm. you know, the flexibility. And how do those different 
triggers or, or levers mm-hmm. uh, play into your decision making about what type of unsecured debt you're trying to you're trying to take? I think for the bond market, our, our first go to will be to the bond market. And so you'll look at, you know, when you look at tenure, um, you know, how long you want that bond to be, it's really going to be on your on your debt maturity ladder. So where does it fit in nicely? Right. So for you, maintain that 10 to 15% per exactly, year. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. And then, you know, and if you have a few years that you can play with, then you'll probably just look at kind of the credit spreads and, you know, what's going to get you your best coupon rate. So when, you know, interest rates were extremely low in 2020 and 21, we went very long. So we did a seven-year and 10-year bond, another seven-year bond. So we locked in for, uh, you know, It probably depends on the appetite, too, in, and it, in the marketplace. And you're, and you're there's likely not a lot of appetite for long-term right now. You know, but there's always investors that have that appetite. So, you know, it actually, raising, raising, um, raising in the bond market is actually quite efficient, i.e., you generally have some good feedback from investors to begin with. So you know what which investors are interested in that you know how much they're they're willing to to put in and what kind of tenure they're like. So you pretty well have a good idea how much of your book is going to be filled and at what tenor is your best pricing uh, going to be achieved. So before you even launch, you actually have this whole soft sounding process going on where you're going to have a pretty good idea. Uh, whether or not the deal is going to be successful or not. And you can decide you can go or not go. So when that soft selling process, you know, you know, concludes and you sit down and we say, let's go, I, I think you have some good assurance that it can be done. So extremely efficient, very different from raising equity, where you have you, you can't be open about it. You have to be quite careful uh, when you choose to to launch an equity deal. The other the other the other market that we turn to, and that's really when the bond market's are you know uh, dislocated or we don't like where spreads are, then we, we access the, the the bank term loan market and the bank term loan market is is great when you're investment grade like like granite because you have good um, banking relationships. The Canadian banks are extremely supportive of inv- in, inter, of investment grade names, and so when the bond markets were essentially closed, we were able to access term loans and term loans are extremely flexible. They're typically a little bit shorter in nature, like one to maybe sometimes five years. And we did actually lock into a few term loans at five years. But they're, they're great because they have no prepayment penalties. So they're also great if you're, if you're managing towards some type of um, event, like a, dis- a large disposition, that you would then use those proceeds to pay off that debt. Or it bridges that time before, uh, when you can access the markets again, the, or the unsecured bond markets again. So for us, those are the two primary unsecured um, debt types that we'll will access. And is that those the, those bank financings? They're just a little bit more expensive than the bond market typically, because um, of the flexibility it gives you. Like, how does not that work? necessarily. They don't move in a synchronous manner, I assume. No, they don't. You're right, and and you're right. We would turn to a term loan because it's 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 less expensive than the bond market, and that's exactly what we did last year. You just came off a panel, mm-hmm. the CFO panel. Yes. I would love to hear your takeaways. I, I, I will admit we were actually out here podcasting, so I did not manage to uh, to catch it, which is uh, disappointing. Um, so it's you and which other CFOs did they have on the panel? So we had uh, Stephen Coe from Capri. We had um, Dags, <laughs> Dags, Rags. Oh my God, sorry. Sorry, Rags. <laughs> Rags Devlure from Primaris. And we had Larry Froome from H&R Reed. And, and then myself. So... I think the one thing is we are all fairly large. We're all large cap um, REITs. So that probably didn't give a perspective of a small cap REIT, which might have been a little bit different. But I think it's safe to say that we were very much in sync. So we certainly talked about kind of raising debt today and the bond markets and bank loans and when do you access bank loans. And I think it's very consistent to certainly where Granite is. Um, we're also, I think a common theme was, you know, stay disciplined to, to your, um, debt metrics and, uh, debt targets that you've met, that you've set. Um, no one's going to, um, I think, uh, a common thing was that we stay disciplined to our, um, our debt targets and debt metrics. Uh, we had that co- in common, and um, when it came to issuing equity, again, it, all, I think all of us were certainly on the same page that you know, unless equity is trading above NAV, you know, there's no advantage to issuing equity uh, equity below NAV, and the markets will punish you, and investors will punish you. 
We also talked a, a bit about, um, you know, how do you allocate that capital? Do you allocate it to uh, NCIBs, which, you know, all of the- What's panel, that? NCIBs, <laughs> normal course issuer bids, which is when you're buying back stock. So all which of us- Which you guys have been active in. Which all of us have been active in. And I think, you know, I think we're all in agreement that when you're trading at 25, 30% below your NAV, it's quite accretive um, to go out and to- um, Buy back your stock. Let me just do that for the listeners that may not be holding onto the rope. The REIT stock is twenty five to thirty percent below the net asset value of your of your real estate holdings. That's right. Exactly. And so it's accretive to just buy back the stock, knowing that at some point the stock and the market at large will return your stock price back to NAV and you will realize the gains. That's right. Exactly. So you're basically buying back the st- stock at a at a yield that's far greater. Um, then, you know, certainly your cost of equity. So it's going to benefit your investors. But, you know, I think interestingly, though, comments from the panel was it's it's not a free-for-all either. You're not going to allocate all your capital to that. And, you know, in some cases, the only allocation to uh, buying back stock is just free cash flow or uh, or dispositions that you know would be, sorry, just proceeds from dispositions that you know will be accretive to your uh, to your. Uh, FFO per unit. If there was a, a small cap REIT CFO on mm-hmm. the panel, how would they have differed in their opinion of the market right now? Well, I think for them, I mean, their focus, I mean, they couldn't even have, they, they wouldn't be our discussion about unsecured debt. They'd be taking wouldn't secured be, debt. They'd be, yeah. they'd be talking to you guys. That's <laughs> right. They'd be talking to you guys. Um, yeah, their focus would be on secured debt and then managing man- managing those maturities. Um, you know, there's probably, they would be managing a, a credit facility as well, but, but that credit facility is probably backed by a number of assets that they would have to manage and ensure that it's it's creating the right um, debt yield that they need in order to support that credit facility. And I think for a smaller issuer too, and I think it's coming, you know, we're seeing a few more deals of this is a convertible debenture market, which gives them a little bit of access to an unsecured debt portion of, of a debt instrument, but then allowing them to use some of their equity to lower that cost of that of that debt instrument. So, and we've seen that uh, where we've seen some convertible debentures, and then the equity component having a premium on the equity piece of about thirty percent, which would which would make it then attractive and lower that cost. Very great. Um, we're almost out of time, uh, Teresa, and so I just let's just wrap this up. Maybe just best. Um Best bets, or or I know as a CFO you hate to do that. So how about just what are your what is your tone for twenty twenty three, and what kind of strategies are you putting in place today to take advantage of where you believe the market is going? So I think I think the tone for twenty twenty three. I think it's I think I, I'm very positive, and certainly from the financing side of it. I mean, for ourselves, we don't have to really deal with any debt maturity of any size until November. So. F- uh, and I've got a, a bond maturing with a, a low coupon, you know, compared to rel- relatively to today. So I'm going to wait probably, a, a, you know, more time than maybe some others might wait because, you know, as soon as, you know, we refinance the debt we're into, you know, uh, interest rates that are probably double from what I'm uh, refinancing. But I do feel optimistic that the market will be open and it'll be constructive uh, when we get there in and around the, the third quarter of this year. Um, so I think, I think it's looking good. And as far as the business, I think it's going to be a really positive year for Granite. I think, you know, we're going to start to see some really positive trends on, on, uh, our leasing side. Uh, we have seen that already, but a continuation of that in 23 and, you know, the development program that's, you know, we're starting to see a lot of that stabilized this yeah, year. Yeah, that comes on market, your yeah. FFO grows, right? It's going to grow. Strong, exactly. Like- and so it's really setting us up nicely for the second half in 2024. Great. Well, and if the economists are even half right, November should be a better debt market than we're in right now. So it's not the worst time to line up uh, uh, maturity. No, exactly. Yeah. But, you know, I... You I mean, know, who knows, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I'm not going to try and guess, you know, the markets, you know, I mean, we're, you know, those days of like 2% interest rates are pretty well gone. And I think that, you know, we understand that. But is it, is it, is it five, six? I don't know. And, you know, I think it'll stabilize a little bit into the more normal levels that we used to see in the past of about three to 4%. I share the view. Uh, Teresa, thanks so much for coming on uh, the podcast today. I want to thank, of course, uh, First National for powering the podcast, uh, Real Capital for hosting us here at uh, the conference today. Uh, But once again, thank you so much, Teresa. Thank you. Thank you. It's great talking to you guys.